today and let me be the first welcome you to autism rocks and rolls now before we begin i must know that i'm not a doctor or psychiatrist if your son or daughter is diagnosed with autism please see a doctor i only speak based on my experiences i also know on the right to the intro and natural they have found hitzop.com and mintyclub.com i also have a mission daily interview with all of you the mission of autism rocks and rolls is to take the negative stigma of autism and other conditions that may think are disabilities People on special are not broken, not need to be fixed. Those who have conditions do not want to be pitied. There's nothing to be sorry about. I also have some people I like to thank. A while back on Wednesday, December 14th, I spoke to Rachel Anderson for a recording at the Autism Parenting Magazine Summit. I talked about the word normal and why it needs to be erased from the dictionary. Thank you, Rachel, for allowing me to spread my mission. I had another chance to spread my mission because on December 17th, our winter concerts happened at Bloomington's and ARAR Zone, The Bluebird. I not only killed it while being a guest lead singer for the Hair Bangers Ball, but I also killed it during the time we were there because we got a great donation for Dave Kubai and more donations from the people at the show. Thank you everyone who took part. I also done tons of networking. I went to my old friend Zoko Networking first, then to another clubhouse, this one about men's mental health. I ran into some old friends, but I also made some new ones. And since the last episode, I've been on several podcasts. I was on the Hello Polis radio show with Mufaru Mujaru, the Legacy and Legends podcast with Trina Gunzel, and the Journey podcast with David Hackett. What awesome podcast to check out. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear an ad from the barn on Maryland Ridge, so let's get to it. There is a hidden gym in eastern Greene County, folks. Fowler's Pumpkin Patch and the barn on Maryland Ridge Wedding Barn. Autism Rocks and Rolls is very proud to tell you about our friends Perry and Renee Fowler and their place of business. Both Fowler Pumpkin Patch and the barn on Maryland Ridge is a relaxing drive approximately 15 minutes from the heart of Bloomington, Indiana and an hour south of Indianapolis. You can find them at 5347 South Green County Line Road, Bloomington, Indiana, 47403. The property has numerous picture locations, including several rolling fields, antique tractors, red and rustic barns, trees, and much more. Custom Customized wedding packages are offered on their website. The surrounding area also provides several hotels in which to have your guests stay for your destination wedding. Also, Fowler's Pumpkin Patch is a family-owned and operated seasonal pumpkin patch. It's the perfect place to take your family for some fall fun. Enjoy picking out pumpkins, hay rides, a corn maze, and a petting zoo. Call the Fowlers today at 812-327-4895 or 812-325-6022. Alright folks, we're back and yes, if you check out the wedding barn, you'll definitely hear the words I do at it. Today's episode so it's pretty cool because we have my friend Rich Beto with us today. Mr. Beto presently performs with the band No Resolve after serving as a drummer for the band's Finger Eleven and St. Asania. Rich is on my podcast to talk about his struggles with bipolar disorder and alcoholism. Mr. Beto claims that the man has said in, in his words, I have been an alcoholic my entire life. His roles as a husband and father are most crucial. He has a number of kids of his own as well. Oh, and did I mention that he is the stepfather of an autistic stepson? Let's welcome the drumming rock star Rich Beto to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Rich, how are we doing, my friend? Hey, buddy, how are you? My first question is, what does having a step, so it's kind of a two-parter, so what does having sure. a stepson with autism and a recovered addict mean to you? When I met my wife and my girlfriend at the time, I do remember that when we first met and the first time I came down here to Michigan to meet her and Lyric, her son, in London is her daughter. She didn't say anything at first. Looking back now, I feel bad. She wasn't sure how I would react or something like that, which is so unfortunate, but there's that stigma. It's just a difficult thing. I could see like she didn't want to say it. By the way, immediately, the first thing I realized when I met him was just this unbelievably loving kid that had like this huge heart. I've been kind of learning what autism is, and I know it's so different, and there's just not one thing, but with my stepson, he's such a high function functioning autistic kid. He's just the most loving person I've ever met in my life. And he's so friggin' smart for 12 years old. He's going to do such great things in his life. Back to the addiction thing with me, it, he's really helped me because before I had my own son with my wife, Sarah, they're my stepkid. I think putting my heart in, into kids, especially with Lyric, who just needed a bit more of my attention and stuff, really helped me get through that first hump of getting sober and all that comes with that because he had all of my attention. And it's been a beautiful journey with him. He's definitely has helped keep me healthy and sober. I can only imagine that. And I'm so happy for you that he has been able to be a part of your journey and helped you become a better person. Thank and you. I will yeah. say that with your wife, with hiding it, as much as I hate to say this, I kind of understand. Let me explain why. So the reason being is, and it's unfortunate, but when society hears that word autism and you, mm -hmm. they're like the step person who comes in, the step person which was you, 
I'm not saying you would do this, but others might have walked down on them because of hearing that word. Yeah, there's a stigma to it. I think it would say a lot about that person who walked out. It would be a good thing for them to leave in the long run because it would say a lot about them as a human being. But I know what you mean. From her standpoint, I think it's just sort of that worry of meeting someone new. And I guess especially the boyfriend, girlfriend role. She was just wanting me to get to know her family. And, and she was just sort of treading lightly on that. But yeah, if I was the type of person that would have walked away, I would have been a really awful person. She would have been better off without and you, and you gotta take that into consideration sometimes and i think hearing that word autism is kind of a test it's funny because even people that i meet when i mention that lyric is autistic it, you're right it, a lot of people don't know much about it or they just have seen some stuff in a movie or something like that and people don't really know the vastness of what it, it can mean what is to one person is different to the next and how many people out there like yourself so high function it's like you don't even know any have autism at all it's just such a beautiful rainbow of colors with people but i definitely have noticed with some friends when i said oh my stepson's autistic they wow really you know and it's a different sort of attention that i get but you know, i understand i'm so proud to, to talk about it and let people know all about him you know just, he's the best when were your initial thoughts when you learned that you were going to have a stepson with autism and when you were going to be a recovered addict? Well, as soon as I met Lyric, before I knew marrying my girlfriend at the time, I, I just kind of knew that he'd be a kid that was going to be in my life no matter what for the rest of my life. We, me and him just bonded so quick. Like I said, he's just such a loving kid. And he spends most of his time with us, with adults. Right now in his life, you know, he doesn't have a big social circle out there, which, uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to change in time. But it's been an amazing journey with him. And like I said, it's really strengthened me, I think, as a human being. I, like, it's really opened my heart to so many different things. And he's amazing. I just had a son, well, two years ago now. And it's amazing to see Lyric with a little brother now. It's just cool, you know, to see as he's growing. I mean, he's 12 years old now. How old was he when I met him? Like seven, I think, when we met. So he's grown so much in these years that is awesome and i've heard a lot of times that helps too having a brother or sister sometimes can actually help is what i've heard yeah and sure and he has a little sister as well my stepdaughter with him to, after school he goes to speech therapy he's still working on some stuff developing just some social skills and stuff but his sister is just a couple of years younger than him when they grew up together i think it's been really helpful and it's just our family our family is just our normal family inside of these walls this is our life sometimes when we go out he's just different socially i guess what i'm trying to say i easily forget that he's autistic at all so it's really just social stuff with him and then maybe a little bit his speech is a little little further behind than it should be at his age but i mean otherwise he's such an intelligent kid i mean it's kind of mind-boggling how smart he is what i've heard through a lot of people on my parent is you wouldn't know that i am autistic unless you live with me would you say that's the same case for lyric i know i think people know i think just with the speech thing along with the speech just some you know like i'm trying to think of it like tying his shoelaces just some stuff he's a little behind on i don't really know it's so hard to tell you know because i'm like you said i'm just in my family bubble and it's just everything is normal to me but i think he would pick up on something but i'm not sure what people would pick up on exactly and i'll just tell you this with you You're just talking about he doesn't have a social life i'm gonna tell you this it gets better because i have much more of a social life now compared to being in grade school at 12 years old so i guess okay. some words of advice for your son to i always joke around say get your education and get out of there because adult world does have its difficulties but one of the rewards is there's more opportunity for social life and not being judged now, there's still some, but not as much. Oh, right. That's awesome. Right now, I'm not playing in a band at the moment. This is the first nine to five job I've ever really had in my adult life. And I do windshields in cars. I take them out, put them in, which has been very humbling for me in the first place to kind of having done all that style rock and roll lifestyle, do this sort of normal job. But Lear comes to work with me. And I mean, he's definitely going to be doing that for a career. He's so hands on. I mean, he can almost take a whole car apart. He's too small to really cut out the windshield, but it's like he's already found his purpose in life like he's absolutely passionate about this job so i think he's going to be a really good windshield repairman that's amazing yeah. well, how'd you how do you get into windshields was it through you? you just took him to work one day or our family sir is unusual so my wife's ex-husband who is lyrics dad when i came down here from canada to michigan i just met him dropping off the kids and stuff and me and him got along so well i was looking for work because I wasn't playing with anyone. I, Sammy is his name. He got me a job doing this. So now it's, it's Lyric's dad and his stepdad doing the same job. So between the two of us, you know, he comes in to work after school and, you know, on days off and weekends. So he's just around it between 
all the men in his life are doing that right now. Now, what is the most rewarding yeah. and most difficult part about having a stepson with autism and being a recovered alcoholic? The most rewarding thing is because he's not out with a big social circle and stuff. He's with me all the time. Like I was saying, but before I became a dad to my own son, he's really helped me become a father figure. He, it's like he gave me good training to have my own little baby. And he's really made me a better guy, a more uh, gentler human being than I was in the past. As far as the addiction stuff goes, I, I don't know. It's, people say you wouldn't change anything. or I mean, you certainly can't live in regrets about stuff in the past, but everything happens in life for a reason. And if I hadn't uh, hit such rock bottom and, and almost died from all the drugs and alcohol and all that stuff in my system, if I hadn't almost killed myself that way, I wouldn't have then met my girlfriend, now my wife, and my stepson. So it's like this, this interesting path in life. You never quite know what tomorrow brings. And a few years ago, I thought my only purpose in life was to be playing drums in a band, touring the world. And if I wasn't doing that, I was unhappy. I was miserable. And that kind of stuff sank me lower into my depression and bipolar stuff it was much more up and down back then. But I don't know what's going to happen in the future with music. But I just know in the last few years, it's like God put me right here in this place for a reason. And I think to be the best stepdad that I can be to really find my sobriety and my mental health, which like I said, if that wasn't taken care of, I probably would have died. Lyrics right beside me, actually. You want to say hi? He sure, just why came not? in the room. Bring him on. Hey, he just popped his head in here. Say hi. Hi. Hi, buddy. Hi. How you doing, kiddo? <laughs> Doing good? Good. So this is Sam. He's doing uh, Sam has autism as well. We're talking about all the wonderful things in life. And he's got some really cool stuff I'm going to tell you about later on. He's got some really good things to say. See you later. <laughs> Take care, man. So that's my boy. That's lyrics. As I was saying, all of the different paths in life, good and bad, led me right here today. And doing this with you, there's a reason for everything, I think. And sometimes you got to go through that negative, awful stuff to get here. Like I was saying, if music doesn't happen for me, I don't feel anymore that that defines me. I mean, I really do hope still I'm able to do that more in my life. It's not everything to me. That's a small part. That's just what I do. But what I am is a dad. And what I am is a stepdad and a husband. Drumming is just what I do. I try to be really grateful every day about where I am. And I can definitely tell you are. Like, I can see, like, in your eyes that you are pretty grateful for where you are. And while we're into the subject, does that father figure, is that intact in with you? Like, do you have, like, a, do a lot of other kids look up to you? And Well, I guess with... The music stuff at, over the years, you know, you do meet like a lot of younger kids and, and people's kids that have come to shows. I always remember myself when I was young meeting people in, that I looked up to and I finally got to meet some of them. I just remember that feeling I had. And it was always really crazy to meet a kid and to see in their eyes that thing that I had as a kid looking at someone, to see somebody looking at me like that. I'm not sure if I ever got used to it or if I am used to it, but it is amazing to see that you've sort of become that person to a younger kid. Like, people were to me when I was a kid. Kind of like a role yeah. model flips, like you're turning the tables. <laughs> kind of mind boggling sometimes, but you know, you can't let that stuff get into your head. And you know, back in the day, I probably did get into my head a little more, which that lifestyle. And again, leading to all my addiction stuff, there's my head was probably this big for a while. It needed to deflate and I needed to focus more on the more important things in life. So what you're saying is basically your ego back at the time was the size of a big balloon and it needed to be popped. It, it sure did, yeah. And it had it not have popped, my heart would have popped instead. <laughs> I wouldn't be here right now talking to you, that's for sure. Now, what advice would you give to other fathers who have a son with autism and anyone who has recovered from alcoholism? I guess just because I am so, as far as taking Lyric to work and stuff with me, I, I think just I tell other dads, just get him involved out there in the world as much as you can, socializing. Trying to find his passion was... In my situation, it just appeared like Lyric loves doing windshields. But I think I'd suggest to another dad or, or mom just to really try to find something that his son or daughter was passionate about or interested and just really let him or her go and do that and explore and to be out in the world doing that and not to be home all the time or just in school or in other classes or to be out there interacting with the whole world. For me, I can see that really helping Lyric as he's growing. So, and as I think the other part was, was your question was, uh, I, well, I was going to ask half. you. Real quickly, with the autism, so mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I like your advice, but there's an issue. And I want to know this. Okay. So sometimes the parents can get stuck in the label and they don't want to because they're afraid to. So how can other parents encourage the child to go out? I guess being out with them and, you know, a kid 
child looking up to their adult, the best way to be out there is to doing it with them and showing them and, and showing them to be proud. I'm a pretty verbal, loud, big personality guy. I'm covered in tattoos. So when I go somewhere, people look anyway. Because <laughs> People like, who's that tattoo guy? So it's kind of funny when I'm with Lair, he's used to everyone kind of giving us attention in that way, kind of looking. So I just always encourage him to be like, yeah, man, show up, be loud, be proud. And just, dude, who cares, man? Just be yourself. And if anyone's got a problem you tell them to come to your stepdad's house and I'll deal with them. <laughs> All righty. And that's the one thing my editor slash mother encourages you to be yourself because there's so much pressure in society that it's taking that away. And I want that pressure to stop. Right. I mean, there's some pressure we need to have and have some, but it doesn't have to be in every case, every scenario. And I think the walls are breaking down. It seems like, especially in the last 10 years and stuff of just freedom of expression for people all across the board. I think this is a great time to any sort of challenges we might have, not autism or anything else in life. It just seems like nowadays people are really not afraid to express what's on the inside and to go out there and show it. So I think it's a good time in, in the world to be yourself. Now, I do want to talk about the song that probably where I found about you is Paralyzer. So according to another band mm. member, Paralyzer meaning is when everything is pushing you in one direction and your instinct drives you another. What does that mean exactly? I think what they were referring to there, I think that description, the band was called Finger Eleven. I think what that person was talking about was the name, what does Finger Eleven mean? I don't know if it was about what Paralyzer meant. I only know that because I've answered that question so many times about that finger pointing in the other direction. So that answer is sort of what the meaning of the band name finger 11 where paralyzer really is just a, a party song it's so like meat and potatoes lyrics it's just about someone going to a club and there's no real depth to that song which maybe that's why i was successful it's just one of those songs that everyone can relate to on first listen but yeah the finger 11 the band name that was uh how when we came up with that name a long time ago that was sort of how we talked about it a sixth sense or a third eye or something pointing you in another direction in your life i got you and you're right paralyzer is a meat and vance potatoes but for some reason every time i hear this song you'll think it's funny i think like a texas draw oh really nice. yeah like the, the guns pulling out like the first yeah boing i'm like draw the tumbleweed blowing across as soon as the guitar comes in and then i see that man i like maybe we should try to get that in a, a western movie or something <laughs> that'd be cool yeah, that, that would be good if only we had clint eastwood <laughs> movies at this time i know right what is he? He's like 130 these days, or I don't know if he's still. <laughs> yeah, I, I lost still... track with him too. But you yeah, do another uh... song called Slow Chemical, which what yes. happens to be, I'm a big wrestling fan. Oh, cool. So how I knew yeah. that, know this is it's Kane's old wrestling theme song. So other yeah. than it being Kane's old wrestling theme song, is there a meaning to Slow Chemical? So we wrote that song for Kane. WWE contacted us. They were putting together at the time, like an album of, they were getting a bunch of bands to write songs. I can't remember. I think Drowning Pool had one for uh, Triple H. Kane used to come out to so this keyboard thing. So WWE, when they were putting together this album, they just sent us that little keyboard thing. And they said, can you write something around that? So, and it's just like four notes. So we, and we sort of wrote a whole song based around that. And and that became Slow Chemical. So we sort of wrote it as a rock song. It was presented to us as, can we write this for Kane? But really, that song could have just been on our record. It's not really about wrestling. I got into the ring with Kane years ago when that song was on in front of a huge crowd of people standing beside Kane in a wrestling ring. And I'm a wrestling guy as well. I always have been. So that was one of the highlights of my career to get to do that. And then to watch on Monday Night Raw every week him come out and our song and boom, the fire goes off in the ring. It gave me chills every time. Well, is Kane your favorite or do you got another favorite? There's like the old wrestling when I grew up in the 80s and I was a, you know, Jimmy Superfly Snooker guy. I, all of those characters back then. Andre the Giant, King Kong Bundy, Coco Beware, I really liked back then, Georgie Animal Steel, all those guys. But nowadays, it goes through these ups and downs wrestling. You know, I'm not really sure currently who the characters are, but I've become friends with a bunch of the guys in my travels. And Adam, who is the Edge, he's a pal of mine. And then, of course, when we wrote Song for Kane, we got to meet him and hang out. But Adam is a really cool guy. He's a Canadian guy as well. And yeah, over the years, we, I've met a, a whole handful of guys. They always come out to rock shows and stuff, those wrestlers. So everyone I met has been really cool. But man, those guys really get injured. For people who say that stuff's fake, I mean, those guys beat the crap out of their bodies. 
Oh, I, I bet they take risk. I mean, but they know it. Yeah. Unless you're really big, you become a big superstar. They're not making a lot of money. They got to pay for their own travel to each city. So a lot of these big wrestlers you'll see in like a rental car, you know, it'll be like four huge dudes in a rental car <laughs> driving down the highway. And it's a hard world, man. It's a hard life to live. And if you become one in a 10,000 wrestlers to actually become a superstar, then you're going to make a lot of money. But until then, man, you're really working and, and hardly paying your bills and just beating the crowd crap out of your body and sometimes they don't know the price of it that's another industry where drugs and alcohol is very prominent especially in that world it's painkillers and stuff because those guys are get so hurt but we've lost a lot of really great wrestlers over the years to overdoses and also mental health issues of course we know those stories of some of those tragedies that happened oh, i'm forgetting the guy's name now the guy that killed his family and then himself what the heck is that guy's name oh i know who you're talking uh, about anyway that lifestyle is full of a lot of the same stuff you associate rock and roll stuff with yeah it's, it's a lot of ups and downs for sure yeah but if you're able to stick with it and make it i mean i, I think wrestlers are like musicians it's a passion from when they're young and we'll do whatever it takes as musicians or guys like that i mean they'll break their bones over and over to, to keep wrestling just like musicians will spend years and years and years in a van or a bus just trying to get people to know their music and stuff and only a few of them making that too you know i've been really lucky in that way that i know a lot of my friends growing up that were musicians never had the opportunities that i was able to get and it's just a lot of good luck i've been really blessed with being able to follow my dream but of course with that i paid the price in, in some ways you know, it's like you, you got to sell your soul that thing <laughs> you want to talk to you more about your alcohol and drugs so what did using alcohol <laughs> and drugs take away from you it was such a slow burn for me i mean i was always really heavy drinker and back then when we were a younger band everybody was a drinker and it's like it just was in the rock and roll world for you to drink every single night and get completely wasted is just acceptable and normal. If you were to drink that way at home in a normal job, I think you would really stand out more as like, hey, you probably got a problem, you know, you're drinking a lot. But when you're torn around the world in that lifestyle, it can kind of go unnoticed, like you have a problem. And I think I was that guy for many years. I think I was born an alcoholic, but as the years went on, I became more of like a blackout drunk, they call it, where I would all the time, I mean, almost every night I drank, I'd wake up the next day and not remember. And that's really a sign of alcoholism when you're doing that. So, and then near the end of my drinking, I started experimenting more with drugs and, and different kinds of drugs. And then it, everything blew apart then in a really fast time, you know, like the alcohol was there for 20, 30 years, but within just a few year period with getting into some other stuff, I just absolutely destroyed everything in my life at that time and everybody around me. And I did a lot of damage in a small amount of time. So, but again, that's the past. And that's why I like to talk about it publicly to help anybody else that's going through it because you can get to the other side of it. It starts with honesty and acceptance, you know, Opening we are surrender. and surrender. Absolutely. You can get out of it. And again, I know a lot of friends that did not, especially in the last few years, a lot of people I know have died. I mean, it's a killing disease, man. It's out there trying to kill you. And every day that I'm not doing that right now, I'm in a couple recovery programs that say, you know, that disease is right outside my window right now, doing push-ups, waiting for me to mess up. It's getting stronger every day. So if I go back out there, it's going to kill me this time. It's always there waiting for you. So you have to be really vigilant every day. Once you come to the understanding of, of your addiction, you know, you got to really spend a lot of time every single day focusing on that and making sure you're taking care of yourself, body and mind. What was the biggest tool that helped you take care of your <laughs> Your body and mind to where you became sober. You no, know, I got in a recovery program out there that was a group of people like me that got together and they had an answer for me. They had a solution for me. If I stuck around there and kind of did what these people did, there was a solution. So I still remain in those recovery programs. And another big part of my journey and my recovery was spiritual side of stuff. Once I let a God of my understanding come into my life and uh, start my day by praying, I never prayed ever in my life, but I think just the act of prayer doesn't really matter what you believe or who you're praying to, I don't think. It's the act of waking up in the morning and it's just setting your mind in a good place, asking for guidance or asking to help anybody you can. I always say, lead me where you need me today. It's like getting up in the morning and making your bed. It's just a good way to start the day mentally. So those two things, making sure every day I'm part of a, a program, a recovery program, and also making sure my spiritual side is in check. Right.
exercise because yeah, yeah, you got to be healthy physically, mentally, and spiritually because that <clears> spiritual <throat> side is going to take you places in the mind where others are on the lower part of the chain. And for a guy, you know, like myself that has mental health issues as well, I mean, that's another part of my journey too. Unchecked, I can't remember the diagnosis. I have a depression issue as well. There's a name for it that I'm just, you know, as well as being bipolar, I have like a something. <laughs> I'm depressed all the time, basically. If left unchecked, untreated, both, you know, um, making sure you're taking care of yourself with whatever medicine that you need to take, but also that kind of stuff with exercise and with spirituality, that really keeps that stuff in check. So when I was out there partying hard every single day, I was an undiagnosed bipolar guy. I was a freaking train wreck. You know, you didn't know which rich you were getting every night. Or when I woke up in the morning, it was kind of people would be walking on eggshells because is it happy rich today? Or is it like evil, dark rich today? And I wouldn't know either. Which rich are we getting? The hero or the villain basically is what I hear. Yeah. Or like the guy just in complete um, wallowing depression who doesn't want to speak to anyone and hides away and isolates for days and days at a time. So you put that stuff together with alcoholism and you've got yourself a real problem. Yeah, and hey, my dogs are running around playing now. My house is a zoo. I was actually going to ask you a question about that, ironically. <laughs> So with Blarick, does the zoo <laughs> environment like affect him in any way? This environment I live in, the zoo environment, you said? Yeah, as because you described um, it once on a previous podcast. And you said your house is a zoo. And I was wondering, does oh, yeah. that help Blarick or does that drive him nuts uh, some days? With the way his mind is working and it's sometimes, you know, I think he's in the perfect household. <laughs> I don't really know. This is family, you know, and it's this is just what we all know. I mean, I think every house is a zoo in one way or another. And any loving house, I think of the word zoo as a good thing. It's loving chaos but yeah when you have three kids and two dogs and one alcoholic in recovery you're gonna have like a reality show <laughs> yeah that's what it sounds like yeah now i do want to talk to you about another song that i do like never back down so my first question is who the heck were the actors because I watched the music video and the acting was really good. I'll give props to them. Maybe it's out there mistakenly said. I wasn't really in that band. I just did a few videos with them and that was kind of it. Like I never played a show with them. I never even rehearsed them. We never even jammed once together. They sort of had me come in uh, because my wife had been in a video of theirs previous. They asked if I, could, if I would want to do a video with them. So I just did a few videos with them, but it just sort of got labeled out there like I was part of the band, but I actually never was part of that band. Great guys. But yeah, I was just sort of helping out with them for a little while. To answer your question, I have no idea who those actors were. I just showed up and drummed for a couple of hours and then went home. <laughs> yeah, got you. You're like drumming like, what song are we playing, by the way? Yeah, it, it kind of was like that, yeah. That That's great. Now, now, you want to talk about this experience that you said was memorably horrible. You talked about this tour with Papa Roach, and according to you, you were experiencing some withdrawing symptoms. So how did you get through this memorably horrible experience when you were touring with Papa Roach. It's funny, man, because those guys, I'm probably closer to them now than I ever was back in the day touring together. And Jacoby, their singer, he's such a great person, man. He's such a great guy, and, and we're really good friends. And Dave, their drummer, I'm even closer to. I mean, me and Dave are on Zoom calls with each other a couple times a week. And it's funny because that story that I'm about to tell you about here, this withdrawing, none of them knew that that was happening at the time. Neither did my own bandmates, though. I don't remember what year that was, but yeah, I was like addicted to painkillers at that time. And coming off of painkillers, that withdrawal is like a flu times a hundred. You're sweating and you're cold, your bones are, you're itchy. And I had to get out of my bunk in my in the bus every day and go play shows. So it, it wasn't only withdrawing from that, it was also kind of lying to everyone around me, just taking a little cup of flu, which that uh, doing it looks more out putting up a facade and, and this trying to play up some stuff and basically lying that will take more out of you than, than the withdrawal but i do remember that tour that was really the only one i ever went on where i had that happen to me even though tours after that i was still abusing different things but that was the worst experience of my life for sure and you know what and then i came home and started right back up doing it again so I hadn't hit rock bottom yet. Well, let me ask you then, when was the moment you saw that you hit rock bottom? There's been a few. I think inevitably being fired from my band, it was because of my behavior. It wasn't really because I was doing drinking or this drug. My behavior while doing that stuff, I, I really became someone that was unreliable to be in a band with. And I was not easy to be around. I became not pleasant and just unreliable. I became not at my best 
at my craft. But when that happened to me, it didn't really stop me at the time. It just sort of sank me further into depression and denial and blaming everybody else at the time. So that didn't really stop me like it should have. It kind of came to a head with me when I was kind of thinking about taking my own life and I ended up in a hospital and a psych ward for a while. That was probably rock bottom. I got to that place where I wasn't even wanting to be around anymore, which is so awful that it's emotional to talk about that time. But that's really where I was at, man. I lost everything. But like we like to say in recovery programs, I didn't lose anything. I gave it all away. I, I handed it all away. Nothing was taken from me. But I sort of ended up with absolutely nothing. And I kept going for a while after that. But it just uh, at one point, it just seemed like it couldn't get any darker. So there was only one way to go from there. And thank God that never happened. That really began like my recovery. It, had I not have gone to the hospital and to the psych ward there, I probably never would have got diagnosed. So that's really when the healing started for me. And then of course, it wasn't just the mental stuff. It was also then it was time to check myself into rehab and just really start over. You're talking about your suicide. I was going to ask you, what advice would you give to anyone thinking about committing suicide? Just hold on, man. We are not our thoughts and our feelings. We are our actions. That thing that you're feeling that day or that week or that month, or, or it is passing. It's temporary. If we're able to know that in the moment, I know that's easier said than done. This is so cliche to say because everybody says, just reach out. But when I know what it's like when you're there, it's hard to reach out or sometimes you don't want to reach out. So I don't know if I'm in a position to even give advice on that. I just hope to God that didn't happen, but I don't know. I would have to send someone in the right direction. I'm just not qualified to really say much more than just hang on, man. And things change and get better. And whatever is happening in that moment, as bad and, and as it is, it's just fleeting. It's just coming and going. It's like you're always on this moving train. And that thing is one card of the train. And if you just wait for the next day or next week, it will keep moving and things will change. I think pe why people don't want to get help is they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed because people think it's a taboo. When in reality, it's not a taboo to go to rehab or to go to get counseling. Or just to better yourself. You're absolutely right. Embarrassing and, and all that stuff. But another part of that is when I'm depressed, I don't like to say other people. I'll just talk about myself. When I'm depressed, I like being depressed. When I'm that deep and dark, I don't want to get out of it. There's something comforting about staying there because it takes work to get out. There, it's effort to climb out of that hole. It's easier just to stay in that dark hole sometimes and not ask for help because it, it becomes warm and cozy and just you're used to it. It can just be all you know for a while. So the idea of having someone help you or helping yourself, you're not even interested in sometimes. A, a lot of times when you're in that hole, at least with me, if I just looked up, you know, there's like a hundred hands, arms waiting to grab me, you know, and I just had to reach. And I, you realize in that moment that I'm really grateful to be surrounded by so many good people, especially like in the music community. I probably have better friends now since I've not been on the road that are fellow musicians that still are on the road. I'm probably closer to a lot of those guys and girls now than I ever was when we were touring together because now our friendship are real. Back in the day, my friendships of guys I'd be partying with on the road, and I'd be like, I has my best buddy. But we were just drunk all the time together. I didn't know anything about that person. So I think back and I don't know if I had really any good friends back then. I even, and I hate to say this, but it's true. I don't even know how great of friends my bandmates were back in the day. When I think what a friend is to me now, it really makes me think, man, I was not always surrounded by the most positive environment. And again, not to blame anybody or anything like that. In hindsight, it's interesting to look back and just to feel really grateful where I am right now, because I am surrounded by so many super positive, encouraging and sober people. We have a huge community of that out there. So I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Well, I'll tell you this. You're talking about being stuck in depression and not wanting to get out because it's warm. In the strangest way possible, I hear you. Like, I, I really do. Because I've been there too. I've been to the point where, you know what? I'm depressed. I'm sad. I've thrown in the towel, people. This is more comfortable than even trying. It is. You can sit in bed in the dark all day and, and watch Netflix, or you can get up and exercise and flip the blinds open. A lot of times it's easier to stay in bed in the dark. To get yourself better sometimes does take action. You can get help with that action, but uh, you do have to be a part of it. You know, you got to do something. So that's why back to that hitting rock bottom, that's when you finally surrender. When you say, you know what? I can't sit in this dark room anymore. I can't do this anymore. Sometimes you got to wait people out for them to hit that spot. And that's always awful to see someone you know and love that you know are in that place that you've been in before. And sometimes there's really nothing you can do except to be there and let them know that you're here when you need me, when you're ready. Sometimes you got to let people just 
figure that all out on their own direction in life. But as long as you're there for people to help, hopefully they'll reach their hand, like those hands that were reached to me one day or once before. I always got mine out to help others. You also talked about in a podcast that you hid your secret from St. Asania about doing drugs basically so you hid your secret by basically putting on underwear when you went to sleep so you hid it well but i'm wondering did the secret ever come out for sure i always just watch what i say because whenever i talk about my band guys i just i just talk about myself you know i don't try to like put point any fingers or uh or, or talk about anyone but i guess i would say that i wasn't like the only one in that environment that wasn't in a very good place at that moment i think there were lots of secrets going on back then which made for a really unhealthy place but yeah i I look back and i should have been there that time to be more helpful to anybody else struggling and you kind of hope wish back then that the same thing that more hands would have been uh helping than pushing away but it is a business the music business and when you're out there and you become unreliable you know i get it you think you're keeping that stuff much more secret than you really are like now that i'm a sober guy and all that i'll talk to people especially like family members from back then and they'll be like yeah that christmas did you guys know i was drunk and you know my mom would be like oh my god as soon as he walked in the door he could hardly walk and i'd be like oh i thought nobody knew people know more that you're doing around you than you think so there were a few people struggled Um, i'm just glad it seems now that everybody in that camp is doing really well and healthy so i'm super proud of those guys i love those guys and like i said what happened back then and me not being in that band anymore was definitely something that saved my life if i was to continue like i was in that moment I'd be dead by now for sure. I want you to share a story that I heard while doing some digging on you. It, I call it the Motley Crue story, where you basically mm. missed the whole show because you were doing drugs in the bathroom. That's the story that I tell people when I, it's like a really defining story for me. I often tell that because it really shows exactly how dark it gets. So I grew up a Molly Crew fan my whole life. I idolized them. I saw them in concert a bunch of times. So when I was told I was going to be touring Europe with them, it should have been a dream come true. And it was, but it was just so put aside to everything else. The first show of that tour was in London, England at Wembley Arena. And after we played, I couldn't be off the stage quick enough and be down finding a basement in the bottom of that arena and sitting in there on my own. And uh, all I could hear in the background was like Molly Crew songs. And in that moment, I could have cared less about it. So it just sort of shows where I was at the time, how bad it had gotten, where the band that I idolized since I was a little kid, and that now I'm traveling and touring Europe with, uh, sitting in a bathroom in a basement was more important to me at that moment. So, But you also stayed in. bothers you. Why does it bother you? That's the stuff you can't really look back and regret. I mean, it's one of those like many moments in my life you wish I, I could have been more there for. Like, I don't think on that whole tour I ever watched their whole show one ever. I just saw a song here, a song there. It's like those opportunities probably will never happen again you cannot live in the past like that but the last few years of me touring there there was a bunch of those moments where it was like ah but that was the only way then that was the way i was surviving that was the way i was functioning it was i was a sick person i was my disease had gotten to me in the worst way possible i was sick and suffering out there and really trying to maintain and i did a really poor job of it you know something i'll be honest even though you were as you say it felt like crap you still did it i will i'm giving you props for that like you still went out there and did the show Thank you. You know, I definitely still got to do all the traveling and the experiences and the shows and uh, that all still happened. You just kind of wish it was done in a more aware and like really present moment. But again, you know, I'd meet people from back then that didn't never knew. I've met some fans and stuff and I've talked to them again more recently online and they show me a picture like, oh, I met you in Sweden on that Motley Crue tour and they'll show me a picture and I look like death. I don't even look like myself. I'm so thin. My face is sunken in. My skin's like gray. And I'll say to them, oh my gosh, look at that. Like I, I was really doing poorly back then. And they'll go, oh, we didn't even know, you know. And it's like, well, just look at me now. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I look a lot healthier than back then. But yeah, people don't know, again, because in that rock and roll life, you can sort of sneak that stuff under the radar for so long. Not forever, but you can kind of get away with that shit for a while. You can, but you know, here's the issue. It comes back to bite you. It'll come back to kill you. And it'll come back to take everything that you hold dear from you. And it'll come back completely destroy your life. I'm more grateful now for what I have than worrying about, you know, a Motley Crue tour a few years ago. It's like, as great as that is, it's like now in the big scheme of stuff, when we're talking about kids and life, and it it just seems so unimportant. (laughs) It's like, I'm glad I lived through that. But 
th- this present much more important to me than being yeah. on a Motley Crue tour. It is funny because when kids say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a, okay, great. I'm proud of you for doing that. But then once you're an adult, you realize that's not really important. How much hugs I get for my family is important. How much and I, was, I get up a day is more important. Right. And I was one of those guys, that thing that I said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a, I said, a rock star. And I, saw, and I was one of those few people in life that got to do that dream, you know, live that dream. It's a one in a million chance to, to get to do that in the music industry. I'm very, very lucky. I mean, I hope there's more in the future. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, Time will me, tell. Me too. And <clears throat> it sounds like though. I'm not going to say your dream turned into a nightmare. I'm not going to say that because I bet there was parts of it that you did like, but it seemed like for a little bit, and this could be true for some is dreams can turn into nightmares or nightmares can turn into dreams. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. And you can take your dream. It's so easy to take it for granted at the time and think that that's going to be forever or think that you deserve it. And I got to a point like that where I thought I toured for 20 years or something. I just became so like, this is my life. This is what I'll always do. I don't know if I really believed anything could take me out, let alone it was myself that took me out. It's like, be careful what you wish for. And then, but when you get it, definitely cherish it. And, um, is it, but again, it's all easy to say now. When I meet young people that now that are just starting a band, they're on their first tour, they just got their first record deal and they're partying and drinking. I get it, man. Like I'm not, unless that person came to me and asked me something about wanted help or said, Hey, how are you doing it? Or anything like that. Man, I get it. Go have fun. Go party. Do your thing. That's what we all need to do is do our thing sometimes in life. You were talking about going to rehab and you learned a lot of life lessons. So what were some of the life lessons you learned during rehab? I learned so much about myself. The big thing I was saying earlier that like this, the spiritual side of my life, they, that was the first place I really gave God a shot. Uh, that was the first time I ever got on my knees at the edge of my bed and tried properly praying and uh, and you know it wasn't like this big light shining moment but it was a moment of some kind i don't know what the moment was it was just a personal i don't even know if it has word personal moment i had that got me in touch with something a higher power where you can call whatever you want god the universe buddha whatever i needed to find have a personal relationship with that thing uh that was the big takeaway from rehab and then just kind of learning about what makes me tick figuring out what so my behavior patterns of why I was doing the things I was doing, why the self-destruction that I was on, they're all patterns. And when you sort of have, you can map them out on paper, you start to see a pattern. So it was just a really a lot of like looking inward there you know, at yourself, honestly and openly. And you have nowhere to go when you're in rehab. You're there every day. They're on you all day. You're doing classes. You're talking to counselors. You're... I see some people that I was there with, and you could tell they didn't want to be there or they're like a court and made them go there. They got court ordered to go to rehab or it's like go to jail or go to rehab you could there were those people there and it was like man i'm here because i want to be here and i really made the most of it the month that i was there but i was away from my family no phone no nothing you're living with these other guys in this sort of like a cabin and you're up at five in the morning and you're, you're doing work all day it's like you're going to class there's different classes all day long and you're doing that until six o'clock at night and then you're all having dinner together and then after dinner you're doing different recovery meetings together. And I mean, it's nonstop. So for 30 days, you're like in it. So you could either not do, like just not want to be there and uh, try to just make it easy or you could really put the work in. And that's what I did. Can I suggest something real quickly? Sure. Why not? You were talking about how in the future, you don't know what that entails. And I'm just throwing this out there. Find rehab centers, like either near you or like within 500 miles of you. Talk to them, like speak about it and share your story because you definitely got one to tell. Yeah. You know what? I thank you. For, I, I would love to do that. I've been looking into how to do that. And there, it seems like there's a little more involved than I would have thought, but that's something I would be really into doing for sure. And I think I probably will get into doing that. For sure. That would definitely be beneficial for you, I think, and for them too. Yeah, I think I got a unique story uh, as far as like someone showing up to those type of facilities and sharing their story. I I know that mine's kind of unique and it's a good story, you know, like rock and roll stories are always fun to hear. So I think I definitely hope I'm able to do that a little more in the future. You know, I just thought of you could start off with me even a little bit. And I'm just throwing this out there too. Mm -hmm. In April, we have an autism like month gala. We're trying to make the theme inspiring share their story, yada, yada, yada. Look what I've accomplished. You're more than happy. Maybe mm-hmm. uh, maybe we can fill in a spot for you. Yeah, man, let's talk more about that. Yeah, that's that yeah, sounds really exciting. That's yeah, good. That's... I got to talk to the board about it and stuff and my family. Kind of yeah. threw it in the hoop. We call those God shots. You got a God shot there. Boom. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Do you still use that person's help today? Like when you were in um, that, that 
So you pray on your knees and you found oh. that person. Do you still oh. use that person today? My God, yeah. And originally I do. You can look at God as a group of drunks. You know, a lot of times people have a hard time thinking of a God in the guy in a beard. So a lot of people that are kind of atheists, I just say, okay, God is a group of drunks. Just think of that. Or it's just dog backwards, you know, just go talk to your dog. Just think that a dog, it's God. But a lot of people just have such a problem with that word that, that grew up atheist. And I was one of them. And it was really just that word. I had to get over the stupid hump of what God is and what everybody else has been telling me God is to them or what I'm supposed to think God is. And I realized I was putting way too much effort into it. And just be, man, it's just a word. God, like I said, it could be my yeah. dog could be my dog. Of Everything course. in love is love is God. The universe is God, whatever. doesn't matter. So yes, to answer your question, I, every day, it's a huge part of my day. It's starting in the morning and then throughout the day and then ending in the night, always trying to have conversation. And it's not so much conversation. It's just really showing gratitude. And for me, it's about like not asking for things, but just the only thing I ask is just how I could help, you know, like I said, lead me where you need me today. Just how can I help others? When I do that, it just seems like my day changes. I'm in the right state of mind. Well, folks, we'll be right back. We're here an ad from IPBG, and it's a new one for International Pride Business Guide. So let's hear what they have to say. The finest aspect of IPG, or International Pride Business Guide, is that all you have to do is conduct a search in the IPBG database to find a ton of business services. The company's mission is to serve as a resource that combines the best qualities of our LGBTQ family and friends with the best that the rest of the world has to offer. You'll be able to communicate with our family and friends as well as receive information, benefits, and services as a member. Let us know about any new business you know about, as well as those that recently closed, and we'll take them off the directory. We wish to give you the most precise information that is instantly accessible to others just like you. Drop a text or call at 385-383-2585 if you have any questions of yours that need to be answered. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, you'll definitely be proud of yourself, and you'll have some pride in you after you check this place out. Rich, I do want to talk to you more about your son. So in your opinion, what has been like the biggest help for Larry? Is it the, like, what tool is it? The speech therapy? Is it? It's all of it. He's really lucky to have a great circle of uh, teachers around him that are, they're just awesome at school and at his speech therapy. Uh, it, it's a bit of everything, you know, it's like, the, I guess the whole thing makes the pie. It seems like there has to be a bunch of moving parts at the same time to just keep advancing and, and making sure that we're on the right track. It's more than one thing for sure, but just keeping on it every day and being patient and loving and, and vigilant. Now for me, I want you to go back to when your wife did tell you that she had a son with autism. Did you have any questions? If so, what were some of the questions you had? Back then, you first met, I was still using. I was still sort of in a haze in the beginning. So I sort of discovered my own relationship as we went. So no, I didn't have any questions at the beginning. It, it's, it just kind of happened naturally, but it was very organic. I didn't have any expectations or any real anything. It just, it just we sort of slid by. Because like I said, in the beginning, I was just in my own funk and cloud that it just all became very normal and natural, very naturally. Now, I do want to know a little bit of you. And I want to start off with drums because you've been fascinated with drums since like nine or ten. So to you, what is the most fascinating part about drums? When I was young, I loved Animal from The Muppet Show, you know, when I was a kid. It just always looked like it was fun. Just from a young age, I just always noticed that in songs. You know, I just was always kind of listening to what that was. It would just really intrigue me what this drummer was doing. And, and then when I would watch music videos, I'd always be looking in the back at, at drum sets. Wow, look at that drum set. That's bigger than that other one. It's look at that cool color. I just always became fascinated with like drums. And then of course, into my teenage years, I started having like those rock star guys that I looked up to and those larger than life characters, you know, like Tommy Lee from Motley Crue, you know, like those dudes that just seemed larger than life to me. So I just always was attracted to that. And it was just fun as hell, you know, it just seemed like funner than guitars or anything else. <laughs> it seemed like the funnest yeah, thing to do. I, I could see that fun a pound on the cymbal and beat. Why not? Right? Exactly. I feel bad for the drums, but hey. Yeah, my parents probably wished I picked up something quieter when I was a kid, but because I, I was in their basement banging on them all the time. But oh boy, I bet your parents are like, "Ugh, why did we do this?" Yeah. Now I do want to talk to you about some of your friends. Actually, when I've heard your friends with actually a couple of people who I want on my show, believe it or not, Chris mm. Cornell and Adam Gontier. Yeah, Adam was uh, the singer of the band in uh, Saint Asonia and Three Days Grace. Uh, Adam's a great guy. I, you know, we don't talk as much as we used to, but we used to be neighbors. When he was in Three Days Grace and I was in Finger Eleven, we sort of came up. We were just a little ahead of them as far as putting out records. They came right behind us, but we all lived around each other and we all 
did all the same shows together and we got to know those guys really well way back and then we eventually ended up becoming neighbors in toronto like living across from one another and then we ended up both uh we weren't in our bands three days grace or finger 11 and then we started santa sonia so he's a great dude i know he's doing really well the band's doing really well he's an awesome dad awesome husband I got nothing but good things to say and love for him can you, can you help me out though put in a word for me so you can get chris cornell and adam on the show because i love three day grace i love like pain i, I love the audio yeah. things. i mean i'll reach out to adam for sure thank yeah. you so much man i, I really yes, appreciate yeah. that now you, you did get to appear on the jay leno frank ferguson and jimmy kimmel show so what was those like? Oh, those were amazing experiences. I think I did Jay Leno three or four times. It's just amazing. It feels like so Hollywood going there and going to those big movie studios or TV studios. And it's always big. When we did first did Jay Leno, it was Sylvester Stallone. And I grew up watching those late night shows. So to be on them, it was so nerve wracking, but so exciting at the same time. Probably they pretty cool some people? of the coolest. I mean, of course, just me. Them very briefly, Jay would come into the dress room and in the day and just thank you for being there. Hey, nice to meet you guys. Thanks for coming. Maybe do a picture with him. But yeah, so you don't get to know anybody there, but it's really exhilarating experience for sure. You feel like you made it when you do those things. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe we're here. So being really fortunate to do a bunch of those. Now I do want to talk to you about your wife more. So how did you meet your wife and when did you guys decide to start having children? I was still playing in St. Sony at the time and we were dating and she was there through all of the dark stuff. You know, she stuck with me through it all. She was the one that helped me through everything, get to rehab, to my mental health, to everything. So she truly saved my life. We were just dating boyfriend and girlfriend back then. And then when everything came to a head, I wasn't playing in the band anymore. Everything had sort of, sort of fallen apart back in Canada. And I just started coming down here to Michigan more and more. God led me here. And this is where I probably hit my worst rock bottom, but then also had my recovery that I'm still in. And I would agree because while you did, where's the hard rock or party guy? Someone saw beyond that. And I can respect that. Yeah, she's she's a saint. She stuck with me through all kinds of bad stuff. Hey, now, so. I don't know, though. My grandmother's kind of a saint, though, too. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> then it can be probably say that about all of our grandmothers. Both of my grandmothers were on the show. And for the listeners out there, see which one was it? 121 Meet Tay Tay and C 322 Accept Them for Who They Are by Grandma Alice. But yeah, both saints, both just great people. Both had different personalities, but definitely strong and very amazing women, I should say. Yeah, it's amazing that the stuff that they went through in their lifetime. Well, my grandparents, you know, like World War II, and every generation has such hardships. And we think that our generation right now is going through the worst time in history but for every generation it's like that I, I mean i can't imagine living through world war ii you know and then today of course we we have all these awful wars and stuff going on but it's all just a cycle and every generation has their awfulness and horribleness and then they're like really shining moments our grandmas and grandpas had them and we got them and our kids will have them no this one's kind of cliche but one life is one big roller coaster you're gonna go up down inverted Turn left and turn right. You really are. Absolutely, yeah. And then there'll be someone at the very end saying, okay, get off. <laughs> There's someone yeah. else getting on. Now, we're going to wrap it up here. So these are just for fun. So the first okay. for fun is what is your paradise meal or favorite food and why is it your favorite? I love good sushi and I just, I love it because of its flavor and stuff, but I like how it makes me feel. I feel healthy when I eat it and you can eat a lot of it and not feel you know, if you eat a huge bowl of pasta, you just feel like, oh, but you can get really full on sushi and not feel like total crap. Sushi, yeah. How do you like the sushi? You, what does your dream uh, sushi look like? You know, I like when they just bring a big tray of assorted stuff. There's some stuff I've had I don't really like, but I'm pretty open to everything. I guess tuna is my, would be my favorite of sushi rolls and stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty into any of it as long as it's fresh. Now, what is your favorite movie or TV show and why do you like it? It's hard to say those. It's like saying my favorite drummer or favorite band. I, I'd have to like break it down into genres, you know, like favorite. I'm a horror guy. I've always loved horror movies. But it's hard to even pick out what the best Quentin Tarantino movie is. Like, it's like six movies, but let alone your favorite movie of all time. I don't even know if I could answer it, man. I mean, I'll tell you this. I grew up loving Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th and all those horror movies are like a big part of my heart. I'll go back and watch all the time. So. They're so cheesy and so bad, but I love them. I get that. There's some movies out there that they're so bad and so awful that it just becomes comical. It's just like, oh, yeah. geez. And I'll tell and you I this, think, too. You ever come to yeah. Indiana, you come to my house, and we'll watch horror movies because I don't watch them, okay. but watch them with my mother. 
it's funny. I'm gonna embarrass you okay, a little bit. Deal. She probably doesn't mind, but she hides behind the couch. Yeah. Okay. She's like deal. on I'll her knees. <laughs> oh, I want to show up for that. Now, what has been your favorite vacation that you have ever taken, and why did you enjoy that vacation very much? We just got back from Iceland actually in November, and it was the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. Absolutely magical. It's one of those places you wouldn't think to go. My wife always wanted to go, and it was like, of course, yeah, let's, I'll do this, but. When I got there, you feel like you're like in a Lord of the Rings movie or, I mean, just, just visually spectacular. You feel like you're on a different planet. So I hope to go back there. I, I've never been to Iceland. Isn't it cold though? Or Yeah, they have harsh winters there. But when I was there, it was colder here in Michigan than it was there. But they have like super high winds and the winter months can be pretty brutal. But in the summer, it's all like green and lush. And... Yuck. My, my weather's like heat. You got swimming trunks on, get sunburned, yeah. have a pina colada in your hands. But I like just... that too. That's me. I mean, I've always been yeah. like that. Now, my yeah. final question is, are there any good memories that you want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? Now, before you answer, I like to end this with like a good memory that made you feel good inside and warmed your heart and a funny memory that made you fall on the floor laughing. It could be with your son, with Finger Eleven, Saint Asania, No Resolve, with your wife. You're all you want to answer it, my friend. Probably the best memory I have is I, I was born in Wales, in, in Great Britain. I moved to Canada when I was three and a half years old. So I got to go over there and play a show and all my family came to see me and my grandfather came. And it wasn't so much that show that he saw. The next day we had a day off and I got to drive to the little town where I was born. And I just spent the whole day and night sipping whiskey with my grandfather in his living room. No TV, just talking for hours and hours and hours. That's just such a cherished memory of mine that I wish my brother and sister got to have as well. It makes me tear up thinking about it. I felt so lucky to be in a band where I got to go over there and play a rock and roll show. And my family over there got to see me doing what I love. Like I said, it wasn't so much the show. It was getting to spend time with him that one last time. So as far as the funny story goes, I'll tell you one that's kind of funny, that's kind of embarrassing. That I was in Sydney, Australia on tour. And in Sydney, they have that big bridge that goes over the, the bay. You can go over it like it's like a tourist thing. You climb up it and they strap you in. Well, this is when I was still a drinker. I went there in the morning after a night of drinking and for some reason gave you a breathalyzer because it's really dangerous. You're climbing up this huge structure. So I did a breathalyzer and I got denied. At the time, our record company was trying to create a story for us in Australia, trying to like, they didn't have anything to really talk about. We're kind of a boring band. So they thought it'd be good to put in the entertainment news the next day and i still have the article like rich beto from finger 11 denied access to the bridge yesterday drunk off it like some and actually made the newspaper so that's probably the funniest memory i have embarrassing but hilarious well, at least it didn't make american news because i don't remember seeing because my yeah. thing is right now if your parents saw that they'd be like this guy right. really yeah exactly <laughs> have you told them about it oh yeah i figure they did if you if you didn't, that would have been great. But if they knew, at least they have some sense. Yeah. Rich, I think that's all, my friend. Is there any closing remarks or anything you'd like to promote? Or No, I, I mean, I'm just really, I'm proud of you, Sam, man. I, I, you're such an awesome example. This was really rewarding today to talk to you. And for me as a stepdad to my son and, our, you know, autism in our house, this is really cool. What a good opportunity, man. And I thank you for that. Episode. Please tune in for another episode coming very soon. I hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble. Thank you very much. I am scared of the face in the mirror.